All right, on chapter four, we want to introduce what is known as classified financial statements. So the balance sheet you already know from chapters one and two is a representation, a picture in time, of the accounting equation. It is the assets that are equal to all of the liabilities plus stockholders' equity. What a classified balance sheet does is structure those three sections into subsections that just gives the readers of the financial statement an added level of insight, additional information as to the financial position of the entity being reported on. All right? So, the asset side has four, for this purposes, there's actually more, but for purposes at this level, four sections. Current assets, investments, property, plant, and equipment, and intangible assets. The liabilities and stockholders' equity each have two sections each. Liabilities have current liabilities and then long-term liabilities. And then stockholders' equity has contributed capital. That's the common stock accounts. It's what the owners have contributed into the organization, primarily to get going. And then what is earned capital, retained earnings. Okay? So let's go over these each section, and describe what's in there. Current assets. Current assets are cash, what you're going to turn into cash, what you're going to sell, and what you're going to consume in the next year or an operating cycle, whichever is longer. So, what is an operating cycle, other than what it says on the slide? An operating cycle is from the moment you start spending cash. You buy inventory, you buy raw materials to manufacture a finished good. You start paying salaries and wages to your employees. From the minute you start spending cash until you get that cash back in the door from selling your final finished goods or services to your customers. And then they, in turn, pay you for the invoice that you've sent them. So it's cash out to cash back in. Or an operating year, a calendar year, 12 months, whichever is longer. Most companies... And I struggled for years. I finally had another professor here finally come up with an example. Most companies have a less than one year operating cycle. I mean, even Boeing. Boeing takes three to five months to build an airliner. From the moment they start building that airliner, getting the aluminum and all the little bits and pieces that go into the air, the building, an aircraft of that size, to the moment that they sell it to the customer, that's less than a year. So can you think of something that takes longer than a year from the moment you start it? And I mean, yes, long-term construction, you know, like building a dam or a highway, yeah. But those, those companies have different revenue recognition and they normally get cash throughout payments at various milestones. Even government contractors get payments along the way. There's a great example she came up with. Now, 12-year-old scotch. Perfect, right? That's all you made. You know, you go out and you, whatever goes into scotch, you buy the grains and all this other stuff and you distill the darn stuff and then you put it in an oaken barrel and you put it in the basement someplace and 12 years later you finally get to sell it. So that's a longer than operating cycle. Some companies 
have very, in most companies nowadays, they go to great lengths to shorten up the operating cycle. Dell Computer has a, fa a famous model. It's been, academics have written about it and such. They actually have a negative operating cycle. Now, how is that possible? They get cash in the door before they spend the cash. Has anybody ever ordered a product from Dell? You buy it in advance. They do not start building your laptop, for the most part, your laptop or desktop until you have already paid for it. So you call them up or you go online, you order a Dell product, you put your credit card information, and then they tell you, okay, it'll, be ship, it'll ship to you in about two to three weeks. And at that point, they, the system automatically puts out purchase requests to all of their vendors, most of which are located either in their factory or immediately adjoining their factory. And they say, I need one power supply and one hard drive and one screen and one keyboard and all the little bits and pieces that your particular laptop needs. And then they start issuing those to the production floor. And at that point, they pay on a 15-day cycle. So those people invoice them for that hard drive from Seagate or whoever they bought this hard drive from. And then Dell has agreed with two give them payment within 15 days, which is shorter than the 30 days that normally occurs in U.S. business. So they get their cash a little faster, but Dell has a negative operating cycle. It's a beautiful thing. Anyway. All right. Assets. So everything, what the current assets are is cash, what you're going to turn into cash. So that's accounts receivable, notes receivable, things like that, short-term marketable securities. What you're going to sell, that's inventory. And then what you're going to use up, prepaid insurance, prepaid rent, office supplies, manufacturing supplies, things like that. All right, those are all current assets. And there's another aspect to that here in a second I'll get to. Investments are long-term assets. So you go out and you buy a whole other company, a subsidiary of some sort. That's an investment. If you go out and buy some raw land with the intent to build a future factory, a future warehouse, a future store, sometime in the future, longer than a year from now, but you haven't used it yet, you just bought it, and you're just holding on waiting for the market conditions to be right to open up this new location. That's an investment. If you've got some excess cash around and you want to park it over a year or two in a bond that'll pay you some interest income, that's an investment. All right? So management's intent is not to sell or use this any time in the next year. Property plan and equipment. Property plan and equipment is tangible long-term assets. We've got a whole chapter on that when we get to chapter 9 after the second midterm. These are big assets. Buildings, equipment, trucks, cars, tables and chairs, you know, leasehold improvements, computer equipment, all of this stuff buy that you're going to utilize over multiple years. I mean, if you buy something and your intent is to use it for a year, and then at which time it'll be scrapped, then it's not a property plant equipment. Yes? So would, like, uh, utilities be in No, utility would be an expense that you pay for, like, CPS to give you electricity or ga natural gas. So that's an expense. This is, this is uh, what you're using the utilities in. Okay? And they're tangible. So what's the difference between a tangible item and an intangible item? You can touch it. It has physical substance. All right? Okay? Intangible assets do not have a physical substance. These are copyrights, trademarks, um, franchise, uh, a license to operate a TV station is an intangible asset. Okay? So this has value. Patents especially have enormous value. 
to companies that own them. But they don't have a physical substance. All right? Liabilities. We have current liabilities and long-term liabilities. Current liabilities are just the opposite of current assets. These are obligations that you have to pay that you're going to pay within the next year or an operating cycle, whichever is longer. So this is all of your accounts payable that you owe all the vendors that help support your business. This is the salaries payable, the interest payable, the taxes payable. Everything that you have due, coming due, in the next 12 months. Then everything beyond that, all your long-term bonds, your mortgage payables, all long-term liabilities. Okay? These are the debts that extend beyond the next 12 months. Okay? Does that make sense? Those two. And then lastly, contributed capital versus retained earnings. So this is oftentimes referred to as contributed capital and earned capital. So contributed is the, what the stockholders have given in the form of cash or property or you know, uh, a patent that they've donated in exchange for the stock that they have. All right? And then retained earnings, as you know from the statement now of retained earnings, this is all of the profits that have been left in the business, not returned to the shareholders in the form of dividends. All right? So that's a classified balance sheet. I think we have an example that you can hardly see. So this auto parts store has cash. It's got some short-term investments. These are management is going to sell these in the next 12, year, 12 months. Uh, they've got a couple of notes receivable, some accounts receivable, inventory, what they're going to sell. So the first four line items there, the cash, the short-term investments, the notes receivable, and the accounts receivable is all either cash or what they're going to turn into cash. What they're going to sell is merchandise inventory because it's an auto parts store. And then what are they going to use up? They're going to use up prepaid insurance and supplies. Now I'll stop right there. U.S. GAAP has one additional requirement for current assets. Current assets are listed in order of liquidity. So what is liquidity? We've talked about it in Chapter 1. It's cash. It's how close is it to cash? Well, short-term investments can be sold today. You can go onto your brokerage account and sell the stock or the bonds or whatever it is that you own in these short-term investments and turn them into cash. Same with notes receivable, accounts receivable. Notes receivable are a little bit more liquid because it actually has a legal document, a promissory note tied to it. So you can go to a court of law or to a bank and collect this. Whereas accounts receivable are unsecured debt for the most part. All right. What you're going to sell, take a little while. As I'm sure sometime here in the next uh, six to eight months you're going to find out from how long it takes to liquidate Radio Shack. <laughs> you all remember when they liquidated Circuit City? It was a while ago. It took almost a year to get rid of all that stuff. Yeah. And it was not the... It cautioned you because when they do these liquidation sales, they do them, it's uh, all sales are final. So there were stories in the Wall Street Journal of people going into Circuit City and getting a really good deal on a big screen TV. And then they, it's all packaged up. You weren't allowed to open up the packaging. You weren't allowed to do anything. You just had to haul it out of the store, sight unseen, and all sales final, and they get home, and there's a big crack down the middle of it. So it's useless. So I caution you, if Circuit, if Circuit City, I mean, if uh, Radio Shack goes the way of Circuit City, which all indications are they will, um, be careful of what you buy. <laughs> so, And then um, prepaid insurance and supplies, yeah, you could turn that into cash, but it would take you a while to do that. All right? So they're order of liquidity. 
And then they've got one investment. Management has no intent of selling this land or using it in the next 12 months. It's just they're holding on to it for future expansion. And then the tangible property that they're utilizing in their operation is the land that they have a building built on or buildings, and then the equipment that is contained within all those buildings. And then they have one intangible asset, a trademark. The liabilities, they have notes payable, accounts payable, and salaries payable. There's no uh, mandated order on those uh, current liabilities that can be listed. Commonly, you see them in one or two orders. Sometimes they're alphabetical. Sometimes they're in order of the largest dollar amount owed down to the smallest dollar amount. But there is no prescribed uh, specified order on those. And then long-term liability is a mortgage payable. Now, a mortgage payable that is due every month has both because the principal that you would pay on a mortgage or a car loan or something along those lines where you pay monthly, a piece of that pays off the loan and the other piece of it pays off the interest. So the part that, pieces off, that pays off the loan over the next 12 months is a current liability. So commonly you will see that listed in both places. They'll say mortgage payable dash current and then mortgage payable for the balance of the stuff that's due after 12 months. Okay? Yeah. So let me go back. And the assets for the trademark. Yep. Um, I know it's on a credit, but what, is, what other account is it credited to? Because for trademarks? For trademark, right? Well, no, you either have to pay for the uh, registration of a trademark, you know, to register it with the government, and then you have to re-register it every periodically, I don't know how many years. Uh, but you also include in here any legal fees that you've incurred to successfully defend your trademark. So if you had to take somebody to court because they're using the Golden Arches or the Nike swoosh, in, and you successfully got them to cease and desist in the court, then the cost, your cost of legal fees for defending your trademark would go here to the asset side of the balance sheet. So that's where those accounts come from. All right? And then lastly, the shareholder's equity. Under contributed capital, they have common stock. And common stock also gives you the information pertaining to the stock certificate itself. So it has a $10 par value. All that is is that the stock certificate has a value placed on it. Some, not all, states, because corporations are incorporated in individual states, some states require some type of value for each and every stock. Of that group, Another smaller percentage also has a law that says you're not allowed to sell the stock for less than its par value, which is why you will commonly see $1 par. Some states you'll even see, see penny par. And so, the, so this is, there's 20,000 shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. At $10 each, that's $200,000. So you can always tell how many shares of stock are outstanding by looking at the dollar value and compare it to the par value. So divide the par value into the dollar value. That'll tell you how many shares are out circulating in the marketplace. Okay? And then anything that is paid over and above the par value goes into a, a separate account called additional paid-in capital in excess of par. All right? But those are both contributed capital accounts. And then lastly, you have your retained earnings, and that makes up the classified balance sheet. Questions on this? Like I said, we're going to spend all of next week doing nothing but problems associated with these. Yes, sir? Uh, do, do people still invest as much as they used to in the stock market? Oh, yeah, significant. Yeah. It wanes, you know. But, yeah. There's huge volumes on a daily basis in both in all of the exchanges. Yes, sir. You buy like you buy like sh uh, shares of a company, and like 
Nope. Nope. That's the whole risk. You sell them because it the price will change daily, based upon market conditions, company conditions, competition. You know, sales gain, sales. You know, sales orders lost. No, that's that's a state requirement with not all states. So there is a state requirement that that the that you're not allowed to sell it for less than par in some states. So that's why they put it very low. So you can sell Boeing stock, for instance, which I believe Boeing is incorporated in Delaware. It may be one dollar par value, but shoot, it sells for you know 160 bucks a share, depending upon the the price that day. You would not be able to legally sell it for less than in some states. That's not all the all states, and I'm and I don't know the list of which states. I just know that that exists. Okay. All right. Here's Dell Computer's classified balance sheet uh, for 2010 and 2011. The first thing you'll notice is from our quiz today. They have a January or had, I don't know what they have now because they've gone pi private. They had a January year end because they want to include all of those sales after Christmas, you know, in their annual report because that's the early weeks of January is a big day to, uh, to buy. So, uh, so they have cash and cash equivalents, some short-term investments, accounts receivable and financing receivables. That's everything they're going to... Cash going to turn into cash, and then they've got their what they're going to sell, their inventories, and then other current assets, that's what they're going to use up. And then they've got property, plant, and equipment, that's net of any uh, accumulated depreciation. They have some investments, uh, long-term financing receivables as part of investments, and then goodwill. And then they have some purchased intangible assets, which I would imagine with a company like Dell are patents, is they've gone out and bought some patents. And then current liabilities, they have short-term debt, accounts payable, and other accrued. So that's accrued salaries, accrued uh, taxes payable, accrued interest payable. And then they have short-term deferred service revenue. This is people buying a contract to insure their computers for three years. So that's a liability. That's like a prepaid revenue. Uh, so that's a liability to Dell until such time that that insurance policy expires. So if I buy a new Dell and I buy a, an extra service contract for five years rather than the free one year, then each year of that five years as that expires, they get to take that deferred service revenue to the income statement. And then they, so there's a short-term portion of it, the stuff that's gonna expire in the next 12 months, and then there's a long-term deferred service revenue for the stuff that exceeds 12 months. And then they have their long-term debt and then any other non-current liabilities. They have a complex, well, a relatively complex capital structure in that there is preferred stock with a one cent par value. They have common stock with a one cent par value along with, and it tells you the shares issued in at standing. And then they also have some treasury stock so what's treasury stock? I'll mention it here, and then we'll, I'm not going to test you on it. Treasury stock is a company going out and buying itself. So Dell going out to the open market and buying shares of Dell stock. Now they do that for a couple of really good reasons, one of which is not so common and the other one is very common. One, if you buy up stock, what you're doing in essence to the remaining shareholders is you're giving them a larger pro rata ownership of the corporation. So it is a, it is a, a tool that management can use, it's not very successful in the long term, can use to stave off a decline in stock price. So if the stock price is going down and that makes everybody look bad, then you can out and artificially stem that downward trend by buying up shares of your own stock. The other more common reason is, is that there is, there is frequently uh, stock option plans 
that are either just unilateral that any employee can participate, so you can take an employee uh, payroll deduction and buy shares of Dell stock or Walmart or something like that. Well, in order to give those employees, and the senior management commonly gets them in performance stocks, you know, that if the price of the stock does well, then we'll give you stock uh, options and such. And so that is, you've got to go out in the open market and buy shares in order to give them to the employees. So that's where you commonly see those. And then they have their retained earnings. So that's, the, that's their makeup. All right, the second one, that's the balance sheet. The other main thrust of this is the multi-step income statement. What you've been doing thus far is a very simple single-step income statement. All of the revenues minus expenses equals income before taxes, less income taxes is net income, all right? A multi-step income statement calculates a series of subtotals that once again gives the readers of the financial statements some additional insight into the performance of that corporation over the period being represented, measured. And they're going to be different depending upon whether you have a service company, you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, you're a medical firm, all you're doing is selling your services, or a merchandising or manufacturing, okay? Merchandising companies buy finished goods and then turn around and sell them to the end customer, HEB, Walmart, you know. Boutiques, yep, all every type of retail store that you've ever walked into is a merchandising company of some sort. Every one that you've ever gone online and bought. And then manufacturing companies actually take raw material, Boeing, Dell, and make something out of it. Okay? But both of them have a you know when we get to the multi-step, both of them have a similar multi-step income statement. The service company is slightly different, and I'll explain the difference. For a service company, we take all of the revenues, and then we subtract the operating expenses, the selling expenses, the general administrative, the depreciation expense, things like that, in order to come up with income from operations. With a merchandising or a manufacturing company, we add a little category right under total revenue on cost of goods sold. So for a merchandising company, for instance, that HEB that buys a pallet of water and then sells you a bottle of it, they have the retail price, what you paid for the water in the store, but they also have their cost to buy that bottle from wherever they got it from. All right. So that cost is a direct cost of that product, and that is cost of goods sold. It's primarily the cost of the inventory. All right. That gives you a first category, first subtotal called gross margin. If you take all of the net sales and you subtract the direct cost of producing those sales, that's gross margin. So, and I'm willing to bet on a bottle of water, HEB's gross margin is probably up in the, you know, 40 to 50 percent. If you paid a dollar for it, I'm willing to bet they paid 50 cents for it. It's probably a pretty high margin, you know. But there are others that may be less, okay? So gross margin is extremely important to analyze financial analysts as to how manufacturing and merchandising companies are performing. Clothing, I'm sure, is a pretty high margin item. You know, for a shirt that you buy, I got to imagine they're getting a pretty good price on the shirts that they turn around and sell you. All right? Then you take out all the operating expenses. These are the expenses for the office staff, for the sales commissions, for the advertising. All of the things that are directly involved in operating the business. That gives you the second subtotal, which would be the first one under a uh, service company. 
Income from operations. From that, you add or subtract other revenues and expenses that are extraneous to your daily operation, your day in and day out work. How you finance the company, whether or not you have any long term loans. So if you have long term loans, you've got interest expense. But some companies don't have long term loans. Microsoft and Apple have very, very little long-term debt. Boeing has a lot, because they're very capital intensive. Microsoft, I mean, they don't need much in the way of manufacturing equipment. All of their stuff is intellectual, software. So they don't need to buy a lot of capital equipment, factories and such. All right, so all their revenues and Expenses go here. If you make some interest income or you buy some stock in a corporation and as an investment, then they give you dividends. All of that, that's not what you get up in the morning to do. That's not your day in and day out business. So all of that goes down here in this other category. And then that gives you income before income taxes. And then you subtract the income taxes for the last subtotal net income. Okay, so a multi-step income statement. Revenues so far, we've been giving you just revenues. All of the sales from the bicycle rental place that we, did, we just did for homework and things like that. The landscaping company that we talked about. That's not the way the real world works. Every once in a while, somebody brings something back. You've all done it. You bring something back to the store and you get either an in-store credit that you go buy something else or they give you your cash back. That's a sales return. Physically returning the product back to the place that you purchased it at. Or your Aunt Matilda purchased it and then gave you something that you didn't like and you took it back. I know you've all done it. You've all taken a Christmas present back. <laughs> Well, that's shrinkage. Yeah, yeah. That's and when we get to inventory, we'll talk about how they track that sort of stuff. So that's chapter six. So if that's a return, what's an allowance? They're still going to give you credit. They're still going to deduct it from their revenue. No, it's not in store credit. An allowance, that was fun. An allowance is the item is too small or not worth enough to be physically returned. You buy a truckload of apples, all right? There's a couple of cases of apples in there that have gone bad. Trust me, the wholesaler and the orchard do not want the apples back. They want you to just throw them away. <laughs> they don't want you to box them up and physically return them back in order to give you credit. They'll just give you credit. Okay? So if it's not physically returned, you just call them up. You may send them a photograph or something like that, that it was damaged or spoiled. Something happened to it. They don't want it back. It's just not worth the cost of boxing it up and sending it that would be an allowance. That's the difference between a sales return and allowance. Okay. So we talked about cost of goods sold. This is the amount that the merchandiser paid for the item that they turned around and sold to you. Or it's the cost of a manufacturer for all of the raw material plus any labor that they use to convert it to their finished goods and factory overhead. And then gross margin is the net sale. So for merchandising and manufacturers, that's the first subtotal on the multi-step income statement. Talked about that. Talked about that. From that is operating income. Operating income traditionally is broken into its own categories. Selling expenses. These are the Expenses that a company incurs in order to directly sell their products. 
the sales and marketing, the advertising that they buy in the Super Bowl, the, the commissions that you would pay to sales individuals that are either out on the road selling for you or working in the store on commission. Uh, the store displays, the items that you actually spend in order to make all of the merchandise look accessible and attractive and all that to your buyers. And then general administrative is everything else. This is the CEO salary, the uh, accounting personnel, the human resources, things like that. All of the things that are just involved in administrative uh, running the company. S subtracting that from gross margin gives you income from operations. This is the profit you make on what you do every day, what you get up and to do. And then expenses not related to the company's daily operation goes into other revenue and expenses, and we'll go over lots of examples of this starting on uh, Monday. And that'll give you the next to last subtotal, income before income taxes. And we were doing that on the, in, on the single step. We did that when we did our first midterm. Subtract from that all of the state and federal income taxes that you may owe, and that gives you net income. All right? So here's a multi-step income statement. So they have net sales of one million two. Cost of goods sold, that is the, uh, the parts that they sell in their auto parts store. That gives them a gross margin of 433000 So not bad, about a third, 33% gross margin, pretty healthy. Then they have selling expenses and general administrative expenses, giving them income from operations of 76000 and then they have interest income, interest expense are the only two other revenue and expenses. But if you, had a, if you sold a piece of, of manufacturing equipment or a building for a gain or a loss, that would go here. It's not your business. It's not your core business, buying and selling buildings. And that gives you income before taxes. Subtract the income taxes, you get net income. It just gives the reader of the financial statement a, a better, a little bit of analysis from the company itself that they don't have to do on their own. Just give them a, a better decision process. Yep. So here's Dell, three years. So net revenue, less their cost of revenue for gross margins. So you can see Dell's got about 20%, eh, not bad, you know. About 18 to 20 percent gross margin they're making on the products that they directly sell. And then selling and general administrative is all lumped together, and then they've got research and development. That gives them total operating expenses for operating income. They just have some interest in other items, so it looks like some, some years they make more in interest income that they, than they uh, pay in interest expense. And then they have their income taxes for net income. All right? All right. Very quick. This is, we're almost finished here. Merchandising businesses are slightly different in that they buy finished goods and then sell it to their end, end customers. So the operating cycle, and we talked about this already, is once they start buying the inventory that they're going to put on the shelf or in their warehouse to the moment that they go out and sell this on terms, credit terms, to their customers or their, uh, the people, the end users that, in the case of a wholesaler, the stores that they sell to, and then the, they collect the cash. So that's cash out to cash back in. You start paying cash for merchandise inventory, you sell it on credit, and then you get the cash back. That's your operating cycle. 
inventory systems, and we'll go into this a lot more when we get into chapter six after the second midterm, but inventory systems can be tracked in one of two ways, perpetual or periodic. Periodic is the way most companies used to operate before everybody was computerized. At the end of a period, whether it's the end of a month or the end of a quarter or the end of the year, you would do a physical inventory. You'd go out and you'd count everything that you had left. And when we were doing our entries for Chapter 3, we were dealing with this. We were going in and I was telling you how much supplies on hand. And then you were able to calculate the supplies expense based upon that. So that's a periodic. You only make one entry to cost of goods sold, debiting cost of goods sold, crediting merchandise inventory once a period. What a perpetual inventory system does is every time you make a sale, so every time somebody walks into Walmart or HEB and they buy an item, it automatically goes out, knows the cost of that individual item, and it makes the entry every time. All right? That's a perpetual inventory system. And that's the way even small companies work. Because you can buy an inventory control system with a barcode on it, even if you just own one store. It's very inexpensive to track it. And the advantage was alluded to earlier is that with a periodic inventory system, all you know is what's on the shelf at the end of the period. You don't know if you sold it, somebody broke it, or somebody stole it. You have no idea. You just know that it's not there anymore. Okay? So you cannot easily track shrinkage under a periodic. With perpetual, you can go out and do cycle counts. That's what we primarily do in the aerospace business. We don't count inventory once a year. We count inventory whenever it's slow. So whenever anybody in the stock room has a little spare time, they go out there and they get their barcode reader and they start counting inventory on shelves. And then you keep that updated all year long. And any time the physical count does not match the computer count, you make an adjustment at that moment in time, and then you track it, because if very expensive parts are continually showing up undercounted, maybe you need a better you know, pair of eyes on that particular shelf. <laughs> so that's a, a huge advantage over the perpetual. All right? The other thing that we want to talk about here is FOB. FOB stands for free on board. What this is, is when you're buying or selling something, part of the terms that you need to negotiate with either your vendor or your customer is who's going to pay to ship it from point A to point B. If it's FOB shipping point and I'm the buyer, that means I have agreed to pay to ship the product from your place of business to my place of business. If it's FOB destination, that means the seller has agreed. So Walmart is the largest retail organization in the world. They are the 800 pound gorilla in merchandising. What do you think the terms are for every product bought for Walmart? Shipping point or destination? Do you think Walmart pays for the freight? Or do you think the supplier pays for the freight? Supplier. The supplier pays. It's all shipping point. Some of HEB is FOB shelf. FOB requires vendors of certain products to come into their store and actually physically put the items on their shelves. They won't touch it. If you want to sell it, yeah, Budweiser, Coca-Cola does that. The bread guy does that. Um, there's a pet, all that stuff in the pet supplies area. Tyson, yeah, it's Tyson. He's located right here in San Antonio. 
It's all... Uh, so that's FOB shelf. And you can negotiate in between. If you're buying something from a, from a factory in China, oftentimes you'll have an FOB Shanghai. So they'll take it and they'll truck it from their factory to the port of Shanghai or Hong Kong or Shenzhen. And they'll put it on the boat for you, but once it gets on the boat, it belongs to you. You have to pay to get it across the Pacific and into L.A. and then on the train to San Antonio. So you can negotiate anywhere in between. So all that is is who pays the freight. I talked about that. Talked about that. And we'll get into inventory in much, much greater detail in Chapter 6. That's it. All right.